The Honorables, the Presiding Judge and Judges of the Court of Appeals of the State of North Carolina. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. The Court of Appeals is now in session. God save the state and this honorable court. Good afternoon. Welcome to this remote argument session of the North Carolina Court of Appeals. I'm Richard Dietz. I'm joined on the panel today by my colleagues, Judge John Tyson and Judge April Wood. We have one case on the calendar today, and that's number 2197. At the Better Health of North Carolina versus the State Department of Health and Human Services. We've confirmed the parties are ready to proceed, so we'll hear from the appellant. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. My name is Patricia Shields. I'm joined here today, although she's not on screen, by my colleague, former Court of Appeals Judge Linda Stevens, who is my colleague now here at Hedrick Gardner. We represent the appellant in this matter, Aetna Better Health of North Carolina, Inc. This case concerns the impl implementation of North Carolina's Medicare Transformation Act. This is a $6 billion undertaking and will change the way Medicaid services are provided to millions of North Carolinians. Aetna should have been a participant in this plan, but it is not because of procedural irregularities involved in the contracting process. And that's the basis of the dispute that led to this lawsuit. Aetna filed a petition for contested case with the Office of Administrative Hearings under Article 3 of Chapter 150B of our statutes. They subsequently timely filed a petition for judicial review under Article 4 of those statutes. That petition has not been heard on its merits because it was dismissed by the Superior Court. The, the facts here that are relevant are procedural ones, and I will discuss those briefly. Aetna timely filed its petition for judicial review on September 23rd of last year. It served that petition the same day on counsel for each of the parties by three different methods. On October 8th, each of the respondents filed motions to dismiss, contending that service on counsel was inappropriate under this court's case decision in Fallon versus North Carolina State University. Now, Aetna learned of this motion on October 9th, which is a Friday at 4.30 p.m. And the reason that this date is significant is that was the last, last day that Aetna could have timely filed a petition for judicial review. Now, having learned about this on Friday, the following business day, Monday, October 12th, Aetna filed an amended petition for judicial review and served that amended petition and the original petition on the registered agent for the Department of Health and Human Ser Services. It could not serve by registered mail that day because it happened to be Columbus Day. So the very next day on October 13th, Aetna served both its original and amended petitions for judicial review on the registered agents for each of the parties. It also filed a motion to extend time to serve its original petition under the decision of this court in the Department of Public Safety versus Owens. Now, the Superior Court here concluded that because of the manner of service, it lacked both personal and subject matter jurisdiction. Now, while the respondents argued vigorously to the Superior Court that it lacked jurisdiction to consider this case, they apparently concede that that is not, in fact, the case because they have not addressed those issues in their brief. But this fundamental misunderstanding of the law is integral to the decision of the Superior Court here. For example, on the motion to extend time, which was addressed to the court's discretion, the Superior Court denied the motion to extend time, concluding that compliance with the service requirements were, quote, necessary to best jurisdiction in the Superior Court. That's finding of fact 35. It also declined to consider the issue of prejudice on the motion to extend time concluding that showing prejudice was, quote, inconsistent with this jurisdictional default. But the trial court must have understood that it wasn't a jurisdictional defect because the court entertained the motion uh, for good cause shown to extend the time to affect service. And the trial court under knows the law and you can't extend subject matter. Jurisdiction is not the sort of thing that can be waived by the parties or created by the court. It's. Um, you know, there's no, I'm not aware at least of any provisions that allow a court to decide that there's subject matter jurisdiction if there's a good cause showing later. It, it's something that you establish at the time of the filing of whatever proceeding. So doesn't that suggest the court, whatever it was meaning there, it was dismissing for failure to comply with the 
service requirement that's in the statute about judicial review? Well, Your Honor, what I can tell you is that every all of the findings that relate to the motion to extend time and all of the, all of the conclusions, I'm sorry, relating to the motion to extend time as well as the amended petition specifically say that the court concludes that it lacked subject matter and personal jurisdiction. And that was argued to the court. And the court appears to have been of that, of that opinion. And in fact, Your Honor, when it got to the issue of considering whether to extend the time in its discretion and to look at the finding of the fact, I believe it's 37, the court says, well, even if I do have jurisdiction and then began to look at it that way. So it appears that the court sincerely misunderstood that issue when it was exercising its discretion. And because it misunderstood its authority when it exercised its discretion, necessarily it couldn't, under our cases, could not have been an exercise of discretion. Well, I think your friend for the appellee is going to argue that what was going on there was there's a sort of an academic exercise going on in the trial court's order where the court is observing that there's some things that don't make sense. For example, comparing the language in the provision about the time to file and then the service. But ultimately, it may be somewhat reluctantly, the court said something like, I'm mindful of the fact that I'm bound by Owens. There's a good cause standard here. But then the court engaged in that good cause analysis, which is a discretionary one, expressly said it was exercising its discretion and then declined to extend the time to serve. So it seems to me that at least part of the ruling is not, the court understood it was not subject matter jurisdiction. I'm not even sure it was personal jurisdiction. Fulham was a, if I'm understanding correctly, was a 12B4 motion. So really what the court was just saying is insufficient process means you can dismiss the petition for judicial review. Well, Your Honor, as I say, you know, the court said that it did not believe that it had jurisdiction. But you're correct, absolutely correct, that it did a couple of things I'd like to address. The one thing I'd like to address, as well as the good cause analysis, is the comparison between 150B45 and 150B46. And I was prompted to take another look at that as a result of a memorandum of additional authority that was filed yesterday, citing the C Enterprises case versus Auger case, which was very recently filed by this court. And in our discussion of the briefs on 145, 45B46, of course, 150B45 concerned filing, 150B46 concerned service, we each focused on the individual sentences, frankly, that are helpful to our positions. But Auger reminds us that we have to look at these statutes as a whole. And if you look at 150B45, it does provide, it provides a petition for judicial review must be filed within 30 days. And if it is not filed within 30 days, this judicial review is waived. In other words, there is a jurisdictional consequence, according to the legislature. And that is the reason, and this harsh consequence is presumably the reason that the legislature inserted the right of the Superior Court to extend time to avoid that potentially harsh consequence. 150B46, on the other hand, has no such waiver language. 150B46 provides no consequence in its language for what happens if a petition is not served and filed in accordance with the provisions of the statutes. And for that reason, there was no reason for the legislature to talk about what would happen if that didn't happen. The other rules would control. For example, under Rule 6B, any, virtually anything can be extended by the Superior Court. And in Owens, of course, this court recognized that it could be extended for good cause. Now, I'd like to move to your other, the meat of your question, which had to do with the good cause analysis. Now, Your Honor, if we point it out in the brief, the good cause analysis was also impacted by the Superior Court's belief that the Administrative Procedure Act should be completely straight and required strict compliance. And we've explained in great detail why that is incorrect in our brief. But one thing I would like to add, the primary case that the Superior Court relied on, the State Ex-Rail Employment Security Commission case, of course, as we pointed out, for many reasons does not apply here. But what I would like to add is this. That opinion has never been applied by this court or the Supreme Court to petitions for judicial review under Chapter 150B. 
It has been frequently applied to cases involving the Employment Security Commission, which arise under TS 96-15, but it's never been applied to Chapter 150B. This court has continually followed the dictates of the Supreme Court and the NRA appeal of Harris case that um, a petition for judicial review that these statutes are to be liberally construed to effectuate the right of judicial review. So this court's, the Superior Court here started with the idea that um, it, it had to strictly construe those statutes when it entered, engaged in the good cause analysis. And the good cause analysis, our, 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 your court, this court's decisions has um, recognized basically three factors to be considered in a good cause analysis. First, was the moving party dilatory? Second, will the non-movement be prejudiced? Third, will the moving party suffer an injustice if it's not granted relief? And in, th in this case, the Superior Court did not address any of those factors. Rather than diligence, the Superior Court looked at whether a mistake had been made. Its focus was on whether a mistake had been made under this court's decision and follow that held that service on attorneys is, is not appropriate, that has to be served on an individual with the agency. This is not the standard for a good cause analysis. The reason that parties seek relief um, in an extension of time is because a mistake has been made, and in fact, a mistake had been made in the Owens case. In I case, think we're going to hear from your friend for the appellee that what the trial court was getting at there, before it gets to this discussion of prejudice, when it's talking about um, how Aetna asserted that there was an agreement, and then the court says, but the other parties confirmed there was no agreement, that that's the court essentially saying, if you had come, Aetna, and said, we made a mistake in interpretation of the statute and precisely how we needed to affect service, you know, and we apologize for that, that the court might have done something different, but the court believed that that is not what Aetna had done, and, and then, in fact, it hadn't said uh, this was just a mistake where we were diligent, and Instead, there was this other reason, and the court just said, "Well, I don't. I, I think, in my discretion, therefore, that that doesn't meet that first factor." And then the court goes on to say, um, "You know, essentially, that prejudice isn't determinative." And I think you can read between the lines there. There was some prejudice, but not not really any showing that would be sufficient for a good to be good cause. And then I, I think the third factor um, is really nothing. So, what do we do about that first one, though? Because our standard is. Was the trial court's decision so manifestly arbitrary that it cannot have been the result of a reasoned decision? And I think a reader of those several paragraphs would say, well, this appears to be reasoned. Reasonable jurists may just disagree with it and have thought that your client should have gotten extensions. So what do we do with that? Well, Your Honor, what I would say that, that, that we should, that I would ask the court to do with that is I, I, I don't recall everything that was said in the transcript of the hearing, but I do believe that, the, that Aetna pointed out that it had been diligent here. And in fact, it had been diligent. While it did serve on the wrong party, it certainly didn't intend not to serve at all. And the court did disagree about the party's understandings of what the agreement was among counsel. You know, Aetna said that we, um, we believe that uh, we, could, we could serve by email. If you look at the findings of fact, the respondent's response is, no, we agreed that we would be serving through the um, OAH electronic website, and that's, in fact, also happened here. But in any event, Aetna was, in fact, diligent, and that's the, the, the minute they learned that there was an issue, they made every, took every step they possibly could to try to correct the error by filing the admitted petition and by seeking an extension of time under Owens. And this court has recognized and has reversed um, cases where the issue of prejudice is where the court has failed to consider it. And I think this gets back to your honor's earlier question, the express reason that the Superior Court held that it did not need to consider prejudice is its belief that the consideration with, of prejudice was inconsistent with what it considered to be the jurisdictional default here. That, that's really the only reason that was offered. And this court has consistently recognized that prejudice is important in looking at a good cause analysis, and I'm not aware of a case that holds that it is not. And in this case, because of that diligence, there's in fact no prejudice, frankly, as a matter of law. At the, all of the respondents knew about the petition on the day that it was filed because each of their counsel had been served. Um, the, everyone was properly served through their registered agents within the 40-day time period 
that the legislature has set out for both filing and service under 152, 45, and 46. So everybody had it. In fact, everybody had it more quickly than the um, parties in Owens. In Owens, the um, court noted that even though the motion to extend time had been allowed, it wasn't served for some period of months. So here there could, there could have been no prejudice because all of the respondents knew about the petition promptly. And, and that's a critical factor in, in this court's um, decisions to consider on motions to um, on the, on motions that are addressed to a good, to a good cause standard. Um, and Your Honor, also, I would like to talk about the issue of the amendment of the petition. In our rules of civil procedure allow for corrections of some errors. And one of the means for those corrections is under Rule 15 of our Rules of Civil Procedure. In this case, because Aetna timely filed its original petition, timely amended its petition before a response had been filed, and that amendment related back and superseded the original petition, and the amended petition was timely served. Now, everyone here agrees that Rule 15 applies to petitions for judicial review. This was the um, decision of this court in the Roan versus Winston-Salem Forsyth County case. And in that case, the reason for it is that the court held that there was no provision in the Administrative Procedure Act that forbids amendment, and therefore Rule 15 applies. Now here, the Superior Court concluded that the amendment was ineffective for two reasons. First, that this was inconsistent with its perception that um, the rules of, um, for judicial review had to be strictly complied with, which for the reasons we stated in the brief is, is erroneous. And second, that the original petition was defunct or not live in some way, and therefore could not confer jurisdiction. Now this analysis is controlled by the language of 150B46. Nothing in that statute provides that a proceeding is discontinued or that a petition is defunct in some way if it is not timely served. This is, this is a requirement, something that the Superior Court engrafted onto the statute that's simply not there. And in this court's decision of Owens, this court recognized that a petition is still alive, otherwise it could not be amended, as this court held was proper under Owens. And in I, I understood the, your friends from the appellees are making an argument that I guess I would summarize this way. It, you know, the purpose of these provisions is finality. Um, as, uh, th at least that seems to me why the legislature created these particular procedural rules so that to ensure that once the administrative decision is done, there is a window of time uh, in which litigants can seek to keep it going by bringing it to the court system for judicial review. And if that time elapses, then everyone has the certainty that the, it's over and it won't suddenly show up later. But if your interpretation of Rule 15 is correct, it would be possible to file the petition for judicial review and not serve it, and then quite a bit of time later, amend it and then serve it. And that would undermine this finality because it would be much longer and those parties could have thought the case was over. So it's defeating the intent of having these very strict rules about timing. So how, what's your response to that? My, my response to that, Your Honor, is twofold. Um, first of all, I would agree that the time for filing under um, 150B45 is a strict compliance unless the court lets you up from it kind of standard. And so, yes, that 30 days has to be complied with unless the court gives you additional time for good cause shown. But there is nothing in um, 150B46 that indicates that the action must be dismissed if, if that 10-day time period is not complied with. There are many, many provisions in various rules and statutes on timing, and our courts under Rule 6B have the authority um, to extend those times. But about the idea that you could extend it indefinitely, Your Honor, there, there are cases where, um, we cite one of them in our reply brief, where in theory you could do that, correct, under Rule 4 of the Rules of Civil Procedure. In theory, you could get endorsement after endorsement, alias and plurie summons after alias and plurie summons, and extend it out indefinitely. But this court has held that that is not proper, and when that occurs, that a motion that a, a case can be properly dismissed for failure to prosecute, and the same would be true here. If you if you if you extended it indefinitely, if you got it issued and never got it served, 
In fact, it would fit squarely within the cases holding that, that that's a failure to prosecute. And importantly, that is not what happened here. Is unquestionably not what happened here. As soon as Aetna realized that there was a problem, they filed their amended complaint and they served the, on the first physical days that they were able to do it. They served the um, registered agent for the department in Wake County on the day that they filed it, and they served the other registered agents by certified mail the following day. And Ms. Shields, you know, this, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, you cited a case from this court, Terry versus Lawrence Hospital, on the Rule 15. Yes, sir. Uh, case is um, about 40 years old. Were you able to find? Anything more recently on the applicability of Rule 15 to relate back on that on that particular issue? No, Your Honor. And I think that the reason um, it, it's hard to analogize between um, the process under 150 B 46 and Rule 4, frankly, Your Honor, because you know what this court's made it clear. 150 B 46, it's not a summons. There's no summons involved. And so what happened in that case, and it's still good law, obviously, but usually those issues are taken care of by extensions of time on um, summonses or getting endorsements and alias and flurry summonses. Um, so I've not found one more recent on that, but I will tell you, Your Honor, that there are many cases in um, that have held Rule 15 allows amendments to repair any any number of procedural errors, not just you know substantive factual pleadings, but any number of procedural errors, even when those cases would otherwise be time barred. Is that within the context of general civil litigation or within Chapter 150B? Your Honor, I I don't believe that 150B does not get litigated with the frequency of these other statutes. And no, Your Honor, I've not found anything more specifically applicable under 150B. With the exception of the fact that Rome stands for the idea that generally speaking, the procedures available under one, under um, Rule 15 apply equally to 150B46. Thank you. And certainly, and you know, on, on that issue, I would like to say that I just mentioned that Rule 15 allows for the correction of any number of procedural defects. Um, if I had more time, I would love to cut vertical case. It's a fascinating case, but I, I want to mention specifically the Vaughn versus um, Mashburn case, which is a relatively recent case from our Supreme Court. That case involved Rule 9J of our Rules of Civil Procedure. And as your honors all know, Rule 9J applies to medical malpractice actions. There's specific certification language that has to be included in the statute provides that a case shall be dismissed. If that language is not there. And in the Vaughn case, the plaintiff filed a medical malpractice action with old, outdated statutory language, moved to amend, and it was denied. Um, our Court of Appeals, this court affirmed the denial of the motion to dismiss and dis amended dismissal based on a long line of cases from this court. And the Supreme Court reversed. And the Supreme Court held that under Rule 15, leave to amend shall be freely given. In other words, we had competing shalls, a shall be dismissed and shall be freely given. And the court held that because there is nothing in Rule 9J that prohibits amendment and that the, um, that the legislature could have said so if it wanted to, that it applied and that this new certification would relate back to the original amendment, even though the case otherwise would have been barred by the statute of limitations. And briefly, your honors, um, I know I had mentioned that this is not a summons. But there are lessons to be learned in looking at the way Rule 4 has been treated. In um, Rule 4, a summons, as you know, has to be served within, um, nine, within 60 days. And you can get it endorsed, as I mentioned before, an A&P summons issue every 90 days. If you don't get it endorsed within that period of time, the action is discontinued. In the Lemons case and the Dozier cases that all of us talk about in our briefs, hold that the time to serve an expired summons can be extended. In other words, if you serve your summons on day 61, the court can extend the time to serve that summons. But what you can't do is extend the time to issue an A&P summons or to issue an endorsement. 
And that is because, why is that? That is because Rule 4E specifically says the action is discontinued. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do it, but the action is discontinued. Here, there is no such language in 150B46. 150B46 is utterly silent on what happens if you do not get it extended within, if, if you do not get it served within that 10 days. Oh, yes, you, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Um, is it your contention that if Rule 15 applies and there had been no responsive pleading uh, from the other side, that you had the right to amend without approval of the court? Wait, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so uh, if, if we accept your argument that any jurisdictional defect was at most personal and not subject matter, the fact that the the, um, the opposing party had taken no action to respond gave you the right under 15 to file an amendment that did relate back. Is, is that a succinct way to say your argument? It certainly is, Your Honor. Certainly is. is there anything else you want to add on that, that I'm missing in that analysis? No, sir, I don't think so. I think it, it, I think it relates back under Rule 15 and corrected the issue here. So, in that case, we would not need the judge's discretion or that we wouldn't even look at his decision under an abuse of discretion, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. That, 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 that is the amendment. Our argument is the amendment meets the other issues. Thank you. Your Honor, if I could, I might like to reserve my remaining four minutes for rebuttal. All right. Thank you, counsel. We'll hear from the FLE. May it please the court. I'm Robert Knowlton, I'm one of the attorneys who represents the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services in this matter, and I will be presenting today on behalf of the department as well as the um, intervener appellees. Let, let me uh, reset the table just a, a moment, if you don't mind. Um, I think it's important to note that, uh, as you know, this case involves a challenge to procurement decisions made by the department. It is an appeal from a final decision of the Office of Administrative Hearings issued by Administrative Law Judge Tanisa Jacobs entered on September 9th, 2020. Under longstanding North Carolina Supreme Court precedent, it is very clear that there is no inherent right of appeal from that ruling at common law. Any right to appeal a ruling of that sort is by the grace of a statute. And as the North Carolina Supreme Court has made clear for over 60 years uh, in the Empire Power case and in the Andre XL Employment Security Commission case, if a statute grants a right to appeal from a decision of this sort, the statutory requirements for that appeal are mandatory. And, and to quote, um, Andre X Rail Employment Security Commission. Uh, non compliance therewith requires dismissal. It further states that non compliance therewith is fatal. This court said we can extend the time to serve for good cause shown. Owens is a published decision, so you can certainly extend the time if there's good cause shown, right? Well, I understand, but there is, um, we start with a, I think, first of all, I think the matter before the court is a matter of pure statutory construction, applying statutory canons. It's not a matter of the common law. It's not a matter of constitutional law. And I believe we have a statute that is clear and unambiguous. Uh, counsel for Aetna is trying to hang all sorts of law on it from uh, Rule 15, from um, Rule 60 and, and other areas of law that Mr. Nelson, uh, if I can ask you a quick question, um, you would concede that this is reviewed just like any other civil action. And that our standard of review, we were going to we review it like we would a civil action and rule 15 is a, a civil rule of procedure. So can you tell me, do you have any uh, particular statutory or case law that says that rule 15 would not be applicable in this situation? Uh, yes, Judge Wood. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, 
rule one says the rules of civil procedure apply unless there's a contrary statutory scheme here. And, and, and so in the Roan case, for example, uh, the amendment at issue dealt with the content of the petition. Here, uh, the argument urged by counsel for Aetna is to cure a time-barred claim. They have no case where that happened. Um, and that would run afoul, would, would run directly contrary to 150B-46, which has a clear 10-day deadline. Um, and, and as was discussed earlier, uh, under Rule 15, you don't have to file an answer until there is a response. And so you could intentionally withhold service for as long as you wanted to. Uh, or, you know, reasonably indefinitely until you, it, you desire to serve it, and then you could am, amend it uh, at your will. So that would completely contradict the tight statutory uh, time frame adopted by the legislature here. And there's, there's, um, so, so I think rule one provides the guidance there when there's a statutory scheme, which we have here that would directly contradict uh, this aspect of Rule 15 that Aetna urges this court to graft on to uh, 150B-46. Mr. Knowlton, um, good afternoon. I, I wanted to, is it your position, your client's position, that this is a subject matter jurisdictional defect or a personal jurisdictional defect? Judge Tyson, thank you for your, for your hard question. Um, I don't think the label is outcome determinative. I think this is a matter of statutory construction, and I don't think the cases are entirely harmonious with respect to whether or not this is a matter of subject matter, personal jurisdiction, or simply non-compliance with the statute. But at the end of the day, it is non-compliance with a statute. Would you and, agree that the standards are different, that uh, personal jurisdictional defect is waiverable, whereas subject matter jurisdiction is not? That is the jurispru general jurisprudence for subject matter and personal jurisdiction. But I would submit that under uh, this statute and the um, Empire State and on XREL uh, Employment Security Commission case, the outcome is determined here by the statute. If you don't comply with it, you are out of court. How do you respond to their argument from Terry versus Lawrence Hospital? that Rule 15 does apply to 150B? There is the, the Rome case says certain aspects of Rule 15 do apply uh, in this context, and, and we don't dispute that. But here you cannot, this is in essence, the expiration of a statute of limitations. And once, there is not a case that deals with an expired uh, time barred claim that you can revitalize by an amendment. That's also waiverable and can only be asserted by an affirmative defense. Is that also true? The running of the statute. That is, and, and that's again, I think we get into some infirm ground when we borrow these doctrines from other areas of law, but that is correct. But here it certainly was not waived. It was asserted in a motion to dismiss and the motion to dismiss was granted. Um, so, are you saying that it's purely a question of law for this court and not whether or not there was an abuse of discretion by the trial judge in refusing to allow the amendment or the extension? Thank you, Judge Tyson. I think that also ties back into Judge Dietz's earlier question. That I don't yes. believe I finished answering. Um, I think there are uh, several ways that the court confirmed this rule. First of all, um, there is, there's no way around the fact, particularly in light of Fulham, that they did not serve this petition within the 10 days uh, after its filing, period. Under Fulham and Butler and Eisenberg, um, I would submit that is fatal. Uh, under Owens, this court re um, recognized a good faith exception to service. Now, Owens um, is very different factually. Um, 
in Owens, the right person was served with the petition within the 10 days. So it's very different facts. We don't have that here. Um, Follum and Butler and Eisenberg made very clear that you have to serve the party and the party is not law a lawyer for the party. Um, so the second uh, issue that Judge Gregory observed was as discussed earlier, he entertained, okay, I recognize Owen said that um, good faith could be an exception to this and undertook that analysis. And with the undisputed record facts here, there was an argument made below that was abandoned about uh, you know, some alleged agreement and the only evidence submitted uh, did not support what Aetna was selling, but that was the argument submitted. Now, Judge Gregory entertained the evidence they presented, but the evidence is undisputed that they did not serve anybody, any employee of the agency, as well as the registered agent of any of the other intervenor appellees or their um, any employee of, of them uh, within the 10 days, nor was there any effort to do so. And I think that's instructive and very different from what you have in Owens, for example. But uh, I think the argument that your friend for the appellant is making that I find the most compelling is to analogize this to the default judgment, the entry of default context, or other similar situations where a court is applying this good cause standard to decide whether or not it's going to reach the merits, or instead say because of some procedural bar, the court's never going to decide the case on the merits. And in those, in that good cause analysis, there are a lot of cases, even though it's abuse of discretion, where this court has reversed when uh, there's essentially no evidence of prejudice, and whereas here, the the mistake was discovered quickly and within a few days, the service was effective or the response often in default context, the, the response is made. So looking at this here, shouldn't we treat this like those cases? And if we do, why shouldn't we say, well, um, as in the default entry default context, we're going to send it back and say, use the three part test that we've described and, and weigh those factors. Thank you, Judge Deeds. I, I think. Uh, one reason is because the statute has no such language that would all be um, interjected and in, over uh, grafted onto this statute by the judiciary when this when the legislature made it clear. And I, I think if, if I could, but didn't that hasn't that ship sailed when we decided Owens? I mean, I agree with you. There's nothing. It's it's odd for Owens to have created that good cause standard because the legislature, if they wanted it, would have put it in the statute. But we said it. We said it in a published decision. And there's a settled three part test for this type of good cause decision about whether to let somebody do something late. So shouldn't we don't we have to apply that now as a matter of our own law? Well, the the good cause exception. I, I think there, there, there are more examples of a good cause exception that don't fit here. For example, if you miss the statute of limitations. Um, you could have put somebody on notice. You could have sent demand letters. You could have sent draft complaints all day long. But if you don't file it and do it on time, you're out of court. Whether they were on notice, whether there's any prejudice or not, you simply don't have to prove prejudice in the context of a time barred claim, which is what we have here. So there are aspects. Let me just ask you a quick question. I, I keep hearing you say statute of limitations and time barred as if that 10 days is final and there's no way that it can be extended. But as Judge Dietz pointed out, we do have the decision in Owens where the court has been able to find good cause would allow an extension for the service. So wouldn't that defeat your argument that the claim is time barred? Uh, Judge Wood, um, in Owens, again, the proper party was delivered the document within the 10 days. So those facts are very different. And, and here, it was also reviewed on an abuse of discretion standard. Here, we, we have a judge who reviewed the situation and concluded, based on the record evidence presented to him, that there was no good cause established. And so you, you would have, under the Sirianni and other cases, you would have to conclude that um, his 
ruling is manifestly unsupported by reason or is so arbitrary it could not have been the result of a reasoned decision. And with the facts of no service and no attempt to serve a person at the department, the registered agent, or any uh, registered agent or employee of the intervener or Pelley's, uh, and the and the only reason given uh, roundly reject, rejected for that evidence, I think his ruling is certainly um, supported by the record and cannot be said to be without reason. Well, but one of the things that's that's interesting here is that uh, in the entry of default context, even though this court recites the the language that you just recited, there are a lot of cases where this court finds an abuse of discretion and reverses. And I think you can read from them. This idea that we're stricter here because we're we want to have the courts reach issues on the merits, and so we want to see the trial court in its discretion examining the factors. And so, what often this court ends up saying is, "There's we can't tell that the court examined the factors." And what I understand your friend for the appellant is arguing is that's what happened here because where is the indication that the court considered that we immediately the day after started the process to affect the service and within a few days afterwards it was done and there's absolutely no evidence of prejudice and there's no examination by the trial court of whether there was a grave injustice done here and so the court just didn't engage in this analysis and it needs to do that in its discretion so you know what what's your response to that is it really enough just to say well there was an agreement but then the other side said there was an agreement so uh in my discretion i'm you know we, i don't find good cause is that enough to you I would, I would submit it is under under the circumstances. We we do not argue prejudice in the context of uh, you know, we had noticed that a petition had been filed. Um, we don't argue prejudice other than in the simple statutory time bar situation, like a statute of limitations. You don't have to establish prejudice. Um, and and so I think he heard the situation about prejudice took that into his consideration, but under all of the facts and circumstances presented, concluded, well, that's not good cause. The statute is, is clear. You have to serve the party. Um, the uh, statutory agent was uh, obviously not hard to find. Uh, Judge Jacob reminded the parties of the requirement in the final paragraph of her decision. Um, for example, my health filed a petition the same day and had no problem serving the statutory agent. Um, and there was simply no evidence of an attempt to do so. And I think under those facts, it was certainly a reasoned decision um, that took into consideration to all of that. And and I, and again, I, 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 I do submit that considering um, if, if you begin to look at uh, all of rule 60 and graft all of that into this statute, I, I think we, um, we have some, I, I, I dispute that that is necessarily appropriate to do um, because it's, it, it doesn't have grounding in the statute, which is the legislatively um, adopted policy. And I, and I see, you know, the Supreme Court has taken up um, the Sound Rivers case and may well um, provide more guidance on, on this topic. Uh, but uh, it and you and you can see that this is part of the context here is there are thousands of cases filed with the Office of Administrative Hearing every year. A good number of those are appealed. So th this is a matter of the everyday business of government. Um, the courts below and, and the parties need to need a clear understanding of what the rules are. Um, and the Context is further, I think, informed by the fact that a lot of those matters before the OAH involve procurement decisions and, and other governmental projects and actions that are moving forward and need to move forward. So it's reasonable for the legislature here in that context to truncate the time to do things, unlike lawsuits that are normally involve uh, assignment of liability and damages for historic events. These are matters that are moving forward. And so with that in mind, there's no reason to think that the legislature um, intended anything other than the plain language of what it said. And, and 
you know, Aetna is urging that the court graft on uh, requirements from Rule 15, Rule 60, and uh, other things when the statute has no such exceptions. So we think that um, the court should, you know, Owens is very different, for example, because the right party was delivered the document within the 10 days, and their good cause um, was established and within the discretion of the court. Here it's the opposite of that. No such uh, service was made. Uh, no such service was attempted on the right party within the 10 days. So in that context, um, with the, all of the other evidence presented to Judge Greger, including the you know, prejudice issue, uh, I think his decision was reasoned and, and appropriate uh, in, in light of the case law and the statutory um, guidance that, that he had. Mr. Knowlton, do you have um, a case or an other authority to address Aetna's argument that I'm Terry versus Lawrence Hospital? I, I pose that same question to counsel for the appellate. And uh, that, that that's on rule 15 and the relation back. Well, re relation back, there, there's not a case that they have cited that allowed a, a time-barred claim to be revitalized. Now, for example, uh, counsel argued about the Vaughn versus Mashburn case where um, the uh, in, in the reply brief where there was a expert witness certification who signed the wrong form. But that um, that did involve a statute of limitations issue, but the procedure of the review itself had happened timely. So it was a matter of, of correcting that technical defect. It was not a matter of, well, I blew the statute of limitations or, or filing deadline. Um, they were able to correct that technical deficiencies. And there are, I, I agree, there are all manner of Corrections that have been allowed under Rule 15 for uh, correction of technical issues, as well as elaborating on a cause of action or um, adding a theory of recovery, so long as the original filing was timely and the original filing gave you notice of the transactions and events that the uh, claims are based on. How do, how do you respond to their 9J case? where you had two separate statutes, both had shall. Basically, uh, without a 9J, shall dismiss, and then you have another shall relate back. And the Supreme Court overturned this court and said, yes, uh, you can relate back on the, uh, the 9J certification. Again, the, the, file, the original filing was timely. And they are allowed to amend the language of the complaint. So I think that is different in character than what we're talking here. There was an untimely service, and, and you can't cure that bar. But that, that, so that's a very different trigger from do you have the right language or the right uh, certification or, or something in the original document? So Mr. Dalton, let me ask you a question. Wouldn't you concede that their original petition was timely filed? The issue is the service and that they amended it and then did the service and that their position as it relates back. But would you concede that the original petition was timely filed? Yes, Judge. We, we agree the petition was timely filed. Um, they would actually had filed one before this one that they dismissed, but this petition that was filed... Um, I believe it was in, in September 20th, was timely filed. We, we, we stipulate to that. So that the, your real issue is the failure to serve within the 10 days of the original filing, and you don't um, concede that Rule 15 applies that would allow them to amend and relate back. That is correct. So we, we contend that, well, there are two independent mandatory procedural requirements to perfect an appeal under 150 B 45 and 46. Step one is you have to file a petition within 30 days of the final decision. 
uh, that statute specifically has a good cause exception to it. Um, I think it's a strong statutory signal in the very next section, which is also a mandatory step, does not contain a good cause exception. But that's dealt with in Owens. But there's independent statutory requirements. And again, the legislative intent seems to be very clearly to move these things along. They, these are matters of ongoing projects and public interest concern. Um, and, and so they are independent procedural requirements. I do not think the label of what you call it subject matter or personal. I don't think the case law is entirely harmonious on that. And I don't think the label is outcome determinative. It's a statutory requirement. And under the uh, Unray State X Rail Employment Security Commission and Empire and other North Carolina Supreme Court precedent, if you don't comply with the statutes, both sections, uh, you are out of court. And that's correct. Rule 15 allows you to amend for a substantive clarification or expansion on a theory um, and, and perhaps things of that nature that you normally see in Rule 15, but it does not let you cure uh, a fact that you missed a deadline of ten, the 10 days. And I don't think you can call it liberal interpretation to say 10 really means 15. And I think if you look at uh, Rule 1, allows the rules of civil procedure to be used um, generally unless there is a uh, statutory prohibition that is in contradiction to it. And we have that exact thing here. Um, here we have a requirement that it be served within 10 days. That's different from the rules of civil procedure. And that's been recognized in the case law under 150B-46 uh, as well. But also it's specifically contrary to what rule 15 would allow in this context. Um, as as the uh, we we pointed out in the uh, tenth circuit case, um, that very you know clearly laid out the the hypothetical of if if you don't have to serve uh, amended if if you can amend before the other side answers, you can intentionally withhold service. So that, they could uh, have, have withheld service for sixty days. And if you can amend and somehow cure that timing uh, default, the statutory mandatory timing of the service, I think Rule 15 in that context is inconsistent and should not apply. Right, and there could be gamesmanship there, right? Because in this case is an example of that. The parties may rightly conclude after two months that the case is over, that the administrative decision is final. And because the purpose of having the service requirement is to make sure the parties know that it's not over, it's going to court on judicial review. So uh, I assume that's your argument is this is um, a plot, you know, we're in uncharted territory about how far rule 15 could go here, but it could certainly mess up the our administrative review process by allowing people to gain the system. I believe that's correct, Judge Deese, um, that there are a lot of contexts, but the, again, there's no reason to think the legislator in, legislature intended anything other than what it said. Uh, Ten day service requirement um, is a mandatory deadline, and there may be uh, in the context of. You know, projects that are ongoing and for other reasons that we might not imagine here today, there could be gamesmanship involved, but it's certainly. Uh, under rule one, it's inconsistent with the statutory procedure here to allow that indefinite opening for uh, withholding service and the ability to amend and thereby undercut the entire short, intentionally short uh, statutory deadlines here. You know, the, the, the one thing that I'm, you're, you're, the other side argued is that it, you would seem to think that 9J is a specific statute that is a jurisdictional. Your complaint is not timely without the certification, and it would be more specific than Rule 15, but notwithstanding that the Supreme Court said no, Rule 15 trumps 9J, which is a pleading requirement, which is a jurisdictional requirement. And I'm trying to look at that case and Owens, and I'm looking at Terry, 
and I'm trying to reconcile those. Those are all binding cases on this court. And of course, the rules of civil procedure are also statutory. That they're they're adopted by the legislature. So that I understand that Rule 50, 150B is more specific, but we've had cases here where the Supreme Court has allowed the more general rule of 15 to overcome the more specific rule in 9J. And, and that's what's troubling, if you want to speak to that. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to that, Judge Tyson. Um, again, I think my fundamental distinction for those cases is that you are allowing someone to articulate something in a complaint. Um, generally, you're talking about fixing a technical error. And, and I mentioned the Vaughn case where the, uh, the review process had happened timely. They were just allowed to, to say it correctly and use the right form. Um, but it doesn't change an historic fact. And that historic fact was they were uh, they did not serve the petition. And there is no case that they have cited that you can cure an historic failure to meet a timely service requirement by simply amending. You can't amend your way back into that. You either did it or you didn't. And they have not um, uh, been able to, and they can't uh, change that historic fact. So that that is, I think, a, a significant distinction about amending to correct something you've said, but you can't amend to correct an historic fact or cure uh, a missed deadline. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honors. And, and unless you have any further questions, uh, I, I think you I appreciate your thorough review and understanding of the issues and happy to answer any further questions you may have. Mr. Nolan, right, you. can you give us a summary of what you would have the court to do? Uh, yes, Judge Tyson, I think um, we obviously uh, urge the court to affirm Judge Gregory's ruling. I think you could do it in, in several ways. Uh, one, I think you could conclude that uh, the timing was uh, not met under 146B and the case should be dismissed on that grounds. Uh, second, I think uh, you could affirm based on uh, the conclusion that his uh, discretion um, was not abused, that it, it was a, a reasoned decision and his conclusion that good, good faith was not shown here um, is supported by the record. And um, again, I think you can distinguish this case easily from Owens and cases where the proper party was served within the 10 days. That simply did not happen here and there was no attempt to do that here. Um, I think it could be, uh, Owens could be more tailored to those types of situations, but this is much more clearly a situation akin to Follum and Butler and Eisenberg where uh, the proper party simply wasn't served. Um, and- uh, All right, thank you, counsel. I, I think we understand your argument. Thank you. Thank Any you rebuttal? May I proceed, Your Honors? Um, Your Honors, there are a few um, issues that came up on during the Appley's argument that I would like to address. First is the um, argument that um, Rule 15 can't be used to change historic facts. Um, I direct your, the court's attention to the Burkle versus North Carolina Baptist Hospital case. It's a fairly complex case, but, uh, but in summary, this is what happened. At the, time, at the time this case was decided, 1982, the rules of civil procedure were still considered the new rules of civil procedure. And this is one of the first real discussions of Rule 15 and its impact. In that particular case, the plaintiff filed a wrongful death action for her, her child, I don't remember, I believe it was her daughter. She had, a, she had qualified as the administrator in Virginia at the time. Uh, in North Carolina, you could not file a wrongful death action and if you had not qualified here in North Carolina. And cases were consistently dismissed and had historically been dismissed, and you could not correct that by qualifying later under the old rules. In the new rules of civil procedure, she qualified as an expert after the case had been filed and the statute of limitations had expired. So in other words, 
even though she was not proper at the, the, the complaint was not proper at the time it was filed, this the Supreme Court allowed Rule 15 to allow this new status to relate back. So, and my point is that Rule 15 is flexible. Rule 15 is there to allow parties to correct errors. The other thing I'd like to talk about um, briefly is what you just heard about Owens and Owens being different. Your Honor, the, the point of Owens, just like the James versus Wayne County case, in both of those cases, service was not perfect, was not done in the way that the statute requires. Owens basically says that, you know, it, it was in fact not done the way that the statute said. It was not proper service under the statute. Same thing in the James versus Wayne County case. In both cases, this court held that the point of judicial review is to review cases on the merits, and those service problems were not fatal to the complaint, to the case. And Owen specifically held that this, the Superior Court can allow that to be repaired by amendment. But one of the differences, though, between Owens in this case, apparently, is who is seeking the relief. And Owens, the Attorney General, sought and was granted relief from a very similar error. We should all be fed out of the same spoon. Now the Attorney General is arguing that, that Owens is incorrect and argue that the Superior Court. We should all be given the, the benefit of these, this court's decisions. And as Judge Tyson has pointed out, this court will do that. This court will follow the, will follow the law in cases that are on the book. As has been pointed out throughout this argument, that good cause analysis requires looking at the issue of prejudice. I don't believe there's a single case that holds that prejudice is irrelevant. And I believe that Mr. Knowlton said, unless I misheard him, that although it was not sent to the proper person, we had it on the day that it was filed. There is simply no prejudice here. So to say that Aetna did not make an attempt on service is just simply untrue. And I think it's important to point out that the statute doesn't, but the statute says upon a party. And Follum interpreted that statute to mean that that does not include counsel. What's interesting to look at is the Office of Administrative Hearings is supposed to send its final decisions to forward those to the parties. And who did the Office of Administrative Hearings forward it to? They reported it to the counsel for the parties. So this is not unusual, and it was not a matter of Aetna ignoring its responsibilities. It tried. It tried, and its counsel tried, and its counsel immediately took action to correct the error. And as a result, there's been no prejudice here. We would respectfully ask that this, this order be reversed and the case be remanded for consideration on the merits. All right. Thank you, counsel. We'll adjourn. Mr. Soar? Yes, Your Honor. This session of the North Carolina Court of Appeals is adjourned. All right, thank you everyone. You're you're all free to drop off now. <laughs>